summer of 2009, Dr. Pedro Del Nido, who's chief of cardiac surgery at Boston Children's Hospital, contacted me um, because he needed help with the problem that he faced almost daily in his clinic. He treats patients with septal defects. These are holes in between the chambers of the heart. And as he explained it to me, he said, you know, we have sutures, we try to apply them, but sometimes the tissue is just so fragile, it tears. Um, so that doesn't always work. And we have devices that work well in adults, um, but they're permanent. And you can't simply downsize those devices because it's really just unacceptable to have to come back after every two or three years and have to take out the implant and put in a new one. He said, is there any way we can work together um, to try to solve this problem? Can we develop some sort of a patch that you could put into a beating heart against the hole, seal it immediately, it would allow cells to migrate over it, tissue would form, the material would degrade, and the patient would be left with their own um, tissue sealing the hole, and then that could grow with the patient. And so we're really excited to work with Dr. Del Nido, but we were aware that this would have to work in probably the harshest environment in the human body, inside a beating heart. And we had a number of ideas um, and encountered a lot of challenges. Um, and so that's why we decided to turn to nature for inspiration. And it's really this idea that every living creature, every plant, every animal um, that's living today is here because it has um, overcome an insurmountable number of challenges. Uh, and those that haven't have quickly become extinct. So in many ways, um, we are surrounded by solutions, which I see as ideas for solving problems. Um, you know, millions and millions and millions of years of research and development. And in particular, what we did here is we turned to nature and we said, well, what creatures exist in nature that exist within wet dynamic environments? These are environments that would mimic um, where we would be placing these, these patches. And we identified a number of creatures um, and specific mechanisms of adhesion that we were able to uh, mimic. And fast forward two or three years of iterations, we were able to develop a material um, that can indeed work inside a beating heart. And let me show you how it works. So Dr. Del Nido had developed this cardioport device. We place it through a heart. This was in a, a pig model, large animal. Place it through the myocardium. We have our patch here with a thin layer of glue. We push this up against the septum and we shine light. It's a light activatable material that we developed. Um, and we come back, uh, or we look immediately, we see two separate pigs. Here's the patch that's attached. We come back at the four hour time point. We add epinephrine to increase the heart rate um, because we want to cover the full um, potential range. And what we see here is that the patch remained attached. Um, we came back at 24 hours. The patches were still there. Um, you see a suture here, which is part of the deployment mechanism. And we continue to advance this. We've uh, teamed up with a, a group to develop a, a way to do minimally invasive deliver of these patches. So now we can deliver them um, via interventional procedures. But we also were able to show that this glue that we developed could seal the carotid artery of a pig, the aorta of a pig. It could attach um, to intestine tissue. And because it's so promising, we, so we decided to keep the, um, the heart application in the lab as we wanted to keep advancing that in academia. A number of um, experiments we still have to perform. But the glue that we developed, um, we decided to spin it out in a company. Um, and so we spun this out uh, in 2013, um, in a, uh, we raised $11 million in a Series A. A company's name is Gecko Biomedical. Uh, and it's really been amazing for me to be part of this um, process. Initially, we were making the material in the one to five gram scale and using it immediately. The company came in and said, you know, we need to make this at the hundreds of kilogram scale and has to be shelf stable for a year, which was really an amazing um, process to try to, to try to do that. Very challenging. But the company's met all its um, milestones and is set to be um, first in man in March of this year. And in addition to bioinspiration um, in my lab, and we apply that in many, many different um, projects, we're also um, very keen on you know, focusing on translation. And I think one aspect or one tool that one can use um, is radical simplicity. And this is the idea that um, we need to keep things as simple as possible the entire um, way through. And in fact, um, what we try to do is overlay criteria on our projects um, so that once we come up with lots of ideas, we only pick the ones um, where we can just uh, uh, maximize uh, simplicity. And let me give you an example. 
So this is indeed my hand, um, and this is my wedding ring. And about four or five years ago, um, I was kind of scratching, and I was wondering what was going on. And if you can see here, it's slightly red, so kind of burning, itching. And I was like, you know, why is this happening, and why is it only happening next to my wedding ring? Um, you know, and is this, if this is 24 karat gold, you know, am I allergic to my marriage or something? What's happening here? Um, and so I started doing some research, and I realized, you know, maybe I have a nickel allergy. Um, and so I did what probably everyone here would do, is I took the ring to my lab um, and I examined it for nickel. And sure enough, um, the um, um, results came back and, and we had nickel that was in this ring. And this is a ring that you know, I'd gotten from a family friend. Um, and you know, nickel's extremely cheap, um, not supposed to be in 24 karat gold. Um, <laughs> And I quickly realized that I was part of the 9% of the population that has a nickel allergy. This is right, 9% of the world population has a nickel allergy. It's almost impossible to avoid. It's in keys, it's in belt buckles, it's in coins. When the Euro coins first came out, um, all kinds of people were reacting because it was a specific alloy that was releasing high amounts of nickel in the presence of sweat. Fitbit had to recall one of their um, product lines because of nickel that's leaching. Um, your iWatch has nickel in it, and some people have been reacting, and even your iPad um, has, has nickel in it. And it's one of these things where you get to a specific exposure level, um, and then you become allergic, and you're allergic for life. Um, and so what we were interested in doing is, you know, what happens now is someone will get a reaction, um, and you can think of people in the um, nickel industry or cashiers and hairdressers, and you know, it's like on doorknobs, it's really hard to avoid, so it can really make your life miserable. So what happens now is you get the reaction, inflammation, you go to your dermatologist, they prescribe a steroid, it settles, but then this happens over and over again. So we asked the question, could we develop a, a um, uh, almost like a, a sunscreen for nickel? So certain types of sunscreens have nanoparticles in it that block the sun, could we do the same thing here? Could we coat the skin with particles that would grab onto nickel and prevent it from going into the skin um, and causing this reaction or potentially prevent people from becoming um, allergic? And so what we did to keep things extremely simple, we had all sorts of ideas to synthesize new materials that could bind nickel, um, which was uh, fairly straightforward for us. But the hard part was, how do we do this? How do we solve this problem with materials that are already available in ton quantity, GMP grade, that are cheap, um, and, uh, and, and really has low technology risk, and the scalability would be um, fairly simple. So we turned to the generally recognized as safe list, we identified agents on this list that we had a hunch could bind nickel if they were formulated as small particles. And um, in particular, we identified calcium carbonate and also calcium phosphate. Calcium carbonate, as many of you know, is chalk. Um, and when we formulated this as small particles, um, we were able to show that it could efficiently bind nickel. And so here you're looking at full thickness skin, so the top to the bottom, we put our um, calcium particles in glycerin, which is an emollient, um, and here we have the glycerin alone. We had lots of other groups here. And when we add a high concentration of nickel, you'll see it only binds to the surface of the skin. It doesn't go through. But if you don't have the particles, it goes right through the skin. And then when you wash the skin, the particles easily wash off. They don't go into the skin because we made them too big. Um, but the nickel that goes into your skin, you can't easily wash that away. So we did a, a ton of experiments um, uh, in the lab, and then also we did an animal experiment demonstrating that this could significantly reduce the um, irritation response of nickel. Um, and we published our paper, um, got picked up by CNN and a number of news outlets, uh, and people started writing in and saying, you know, when is this going to be available? I'm desperate. I need this immediately. And so we decided to uh, launch a company, uh, and we created this product. Um, we had to be reformulated so that it could be scaled and be um, stable. Um, and this was launched on the market um, just about a year, year and a half ago uh, it, uh, as part of this company, Skin to Feek, which is uh, based in, in, in Paris. And the company has now kind of taken on this approach of radical simplicity um, uh, to create other products. And so now there's, there's a number of products. Um, with this nickel protection cream, after publication, we had clinical proof of concept within two years. And then within a year after that, um, we were on the, the market. Um, and this is being sold now. These products are being sold now on Amazon, a bunch of pharmacies in, in Europe, uh, and also in Boston.
And then just to highlight um, one other product that was developed in Skin to Feek, this is um, a hydrating gel. They use the same concept of radical simplicity, and we're able to find a generally recognized safe agent um, that could be formulated in a three-dimensional structure that could um, bind water extremely well. So lots and lots of um, water that could keep it in close contact with the skin. Um, and this, so 40% of the ingredients in here are hydration. So this is potentially the best um, moisturizer um, that exists on the market. And then we're also able to take active agents that exist on the generally recognized as safe list and entrap them in these three-dimensional structures. And just to give you an example of some of the results that we've been seeing, so this is someone who, had, uh, who has psoriasis um, and they've tried everything, nothing worked. They describe themselves as kind of, um, almost handicapped because they couldn't touch things with their hands, they started using this super hydrating gel. And it's this principle that the skin has a natural ability to repair itself, but you just have to keep it super hydrated and prevent irrit irritating agents from contacting it. So this product has only eight ingredients, was really hard to formulate, um, nothing in it that causes allergic reactions or irritations, but you see within two weeks and um, the skin's almost fully clear. And there's many, many examples um, of this for that product. And here's just an example of the zip codes where people have purchased this product um, as of uh, November of, of last year. Um, we, and we had launched about a year um, prior to that. And then finally, just want to share with you one last thing, um, another area in my lab where we've applied this concept of radical simplicity, um, which is to a problem um, that is really scary um, and extremely sad, uh, which is in the battery industry, um, kids are actually swallowing these button cell batteries, um, these coin cells that can get lodged into the esophagus. And then what happens is, is that it short circuits a current forms um, that raises the pH and then it burns a hole through the esophagus. And um, this is a child um, who just uh, several weeks ago um, died from, from uh, swallowing a, a button battery. And the parents have no idea where this came from. Um, there's been 73,000 cases reported over the last 30 years, um, and uh, a lot of them have led to, to injury. And so we were determined to try to solve this. And so what we did is we made a simple observation, which is whenever you put a battery into a device, you always have to put pressure on it, right? You always have to kind of click it into place. So there's a force that needs to be applied. And we did some calculations, and we realized that that force is actually significant, significantly higher than the force that the esophagus would exert on a battery if you swallow it. And so what we did is we created a pressure sensitive coating that's fully insulating and waterproof. Um, so if you swallow it, there's no chance of um, a current forming. But when you put it into a device, the pressure sensitive coating converts to a very efficient conductor and works perfectly. And so we identified materials off the shelf for this. Um, they're on your touch screen to get uh, uh, location specific information, um, quantum tunneling composites. We coated the batteries, we fed them to pigs, um, and we demonstrated, at least in this model, that our coated batteries were safe. We could put this in stomach acid for 48 hours and nothing happens to the battery. Um, and here, the standard battery um, causes sig significant damage. And we showed that our batteries worked fine, um, the same as normal batteries um, in many different devices. So we're in the process of working with battery manufacturers and, and um, uh, patient safety advocacy groups, the US government, to try to bring this forward. So in closing, I just wanted to um, you know, summarize that you know, we've been using a number of tools, and this is just two of many that we um, uh, employ in the lab, bioinspiration. We're not mimicking nature. We're actually just looking at nature um, for a, 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 and, and taking examples in nature and then improving on them for our own purposes. Uh, and then uh, radical simplicity, where we're really trying to make things as simple as possible uh, to minimize risks moving forward and maximize translation. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.